Welcome back and welcome back to my spectator enrollees. We're about to begin our discussion, but before we do, let's be sure we're all on the correct page. Find your Facebook or window and click on the link, go to discussion. Remember that your MCQs, your answers, and your performance will be shown. You will see your case number, question number, and your response along with the response. The green answer is the correct answer. And before we start the discussion, let me turn everything over. Dr. Shaw, do you have all your links ready? You there? Yes, I am. Do you, do you see my screen? Yes, sir, I do. I will now mute myself and you may begin. Okay, great. Uh, well, we'll go ahead and begin. Um, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brent. I'm, I'm a uh, attending staff at Henry Ford Hospital. And, um, and so we're going to uh, spend I guess 70, you know, up until 12 o'clock, going through these questions, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, just uh, wanted to let you know, um, I, I, I'm actually the author, co-author of, of two books. Um, the one on your right is actually a, a new book that came out late last year, which is geared for the uh, core exam, uh, 300 questions uh, related to breast imaging. Some of the questions are, are very similar to just as I, I've shown you uh, today. So, and the one on the left is more for the oral exam. So um, we're going to go ahead with case. Uh, actually, before we even do that, we're going to I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a spiel and and just tell you the importance of just knowing your BIRAD. And BIRAD stands for Press Imaging Reporting and Data System. And uh, it's, it's just a standardized reporting system used. You guys need to know this. Um, there is a fifth edition that just came out, but for this year's um, core exam, my understanding, uh, talking to individuals, that the fifth edition of the BIRADS is not going to be tested um, on this uh, year's core exam. Um, so it's really just the fourth edition. Um, if you don't have the BIRADS Atlas at your institution, you could go to this website, um, which which uh, would provide you a little bit, uh, actually a nice summary of the BIRADS uh, for all the modalities uh, that are mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. Um, and so we're going to go with the uh, first case. Um, case Excuse me, one. Dr. Shaw, before you begin. May I ask you to speak up just a little bit louder? Oh, okay. And, and then may I please ask my enrollees today to please use both case numbers and question numbers and that your questions will be answered at the end of the discussion. Sir, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Welcome. Um, okay. Uh, so we're going to go with uh, case number one. And, and case number one was uh, one through five questions. And uh, which of the following ultrasound lexicon lexicon terms best describes the finding scenes. And um, what we see here is an irregular solid hypochoic mass. And um, this mass is, is actually anti-parallel uh, to the chest wall. And it has some angular margins. And so the correct answer, and the majority of you uh, got it right, is that of an irregular hypochoic mass with irregular margins. And so uh, again, that, that just kind of um, hammers the point. Just to know your uh, BIRAS lexicon uh, must, must read. I'm going to go to question number two. Question two, based on the ultrasound images, which one of the following is the most appropriate BIRAS category? And uh, majority of you got this correct. Um, and I, I guess what would be nice is just to uh, reiterate what is the BIRADS uh, category assessments. Um, BIRADS 0 is an incomplete exam, either needs additional imaging evaluation 
or prior mammography uh, exams for comparison. Uh, a category one, which is not listed as the answer to choice, is a negative exam. No imaging findings uh, to suggest for malignancy, and it's just a routine follow-up mammogram. And then as far as category two, by rads two, uh, that is benign findings. Uh, when describing one or more specific benign findings in the report, and it's just a routine follow-up exam. Um, and then IRADS-3 is probably benign finding. Um, initial short interval follow-up is, is suggested, and the finding should have less than a 2% risk of malignancy. The finding is expected to change over the follow-up interval. And then a, a BIRADS-4 um, is a suspicious abnormality. A biopsy should be considered, and findings do not have the classic appearance um, of malignancy, but have a range of probability of malignancy that is greater than those in Category 3. Um, there's some optional subdivisions of BIRADS-4 for A, which is suspicion, uh, for B, intermediate suspicion, and for C, moderate suspicion. Uh, that is optional. Um, and that's, uh, that's because uh, of this subdivision was done because the, um, from 2 to 94 percent is the range of, of malignancy for BIRADS-4. And then BIRADS-5, which is not listed in choice, is highly suggestive malignancy. It, um, usually uh, um, those lesions have a probability of greater or equal to 95 percent of malignancy, so biopsy is recommended. And BIRADS-6 is a known biopsy, proven malignancy, and it's, it's just appropriate action should be taken. Categories for lesions identified on the imaging study that has been biopsied and proven malignant prior to uh, definitive therapy. So the appropriate uh, category uh, would be a BIRADS-4, and that would be uh, to biopsy it, and it could be amenable to an ultrasound guided coronal biopsy. Question number three. Ultrasound-guided corneal biopsy results reveal radial scar. Which of the following is the most appropriate recommendation? Um, as far as a radial scar, a radial scar is, is considered a high-risk lesion um, that is associated with tubular carcinoma. Um, there's a consensus that radial on corneal biopsy mandates excisional biopsy. Question four, which of the following pathology results is most likely to be discordant with the imaging findings of an irregular mass? Um, the answer, answer, correct answer choice is PASH, or pseudoangiomatosis stromal hyperplasia. And um, as far as uh, the most, most frequent manographic and sonographic imaging appearance of PASH is a circumscribed mass that resembles a fibroadenoma. Tubular carcinoma, radial scar, and post-surgical changes typically occur as an irregular mass. You recommend a, a breast biopsy on a patient but discovers she's on aspirin. What's the next best step in management? As far as the uh, Correct answer choice, unfortunately, many of you guys got this uh, question wrong. Um, several studies confirm breast biopsies are safe in patients on uh, antiplatelet or anticoagulation medication, but not on taking clopidogrel. Uh, it's C-L-O-P-I-D-O-G-R-E-L. Um, and so, um, however, there, there is a slight increased risk of hematoma for which patient should be consented. So Dr. That's, Shaw? Yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. <clears throat> Some of our enrollers are having a very difficult time hearing you, so could I please ask you, sir, to speak just a little bit louder? Okay, okay. Is this, is this good? Do that's you better. More? You sound like you're going in and out just a little bit. Oh, okay. I am, I am sorry, um, but thank you for letting me know. Um, okay, so we're, we're going to go on to case number two, 
and case two uh, with a bilateral mammogram just showing you the MLO views, the medial lateral oblique views, and uh, the breast composition one could give is, is fatty breast composition, predominantly fat, fatty, and um, what we're seeing in the axilla um, are some lymph nodes. This particular, this high density uh, mass, uh, and, and actually in this particular case we, we wouldn't call it a mass because it's a one view finding. It's an asymmetry or mass-like asymmetry. Um, we want to confirm if it, if it was seen on the CC view. Um, but uh, And then what we have here is this uh, imaginary line here that was drawn, uh, the posterior nipple line, uh, which is 13 centimeters. Um, so the, um, the abnormality, uh, the question is where is the abnormality located? And what we have is an abnormality. That's, this is the abnormality, a high density mass. Um, again, it's, I keep saying mass, but it's actually a mass like asymmetry. It's only a one view finding. The mass has to be seen on two views. Um, a focal asymmetry has to be seen on two views, but does not have convex borders. Um, so in this particular case, it's asking, um, or for this particular question, where is the abnormality located, and it wants to know the depth. Um, so in this particular case, it's, it's located in the posterior depth. We break the breast into, um, into actually uh, an anterior one-third, middle one-third, and posterior one-third um, on the CC as well as on the MLO. So in this particular case, it's, it's, it's posteriorly located. And so question number two, what is the abnormal finding on these uh, images? As far as um, the answer choices uh, that, that have been given, it's the only one that would really make sense is axillary lymphadenopathy. Um, and axillary lymphadenopathy is, is defined as an axillary lymph node that is greater than two centimeters in size or a cortical thickness of greater or equal to three millimeters. Abnormal lymph nodes may show increased density, become round or irregular in shape, and um, have partial or complete loss of the fatty hyaline. Question three, what is the uh, CC view did not show the finding what is the next best step? And usually um, for an abnormal axillary lymph node, you'll best appreciate it on the MLO view, um, but you won't see it on the CC view. Um, and so in this particular case, we want to further assess this by ultrasound. The other answer choices don't make, uh, make sense. A stereotactic biopsy, this, this lesion is way far posterior um, and that's one of the limitations of stereotactic core biopsy is, is posterior lesions. And an MRI is not really going to um, help us in this particular case. Uh, it won't just, it won't, it will show the same finding. Um, but we want to, we want to eva further evaluate this by ultrasound. We don't necessarily need to do a breast MRI. That's a little too obsessive. Um, so, As far as, uh, based on images, what's the most likely diagnosis? And the majority of you uh, got this question correct. And so um, as far as uh, the differential diagnosis for unilateral lymphadenopathy, that includes metastasis. Uh, that's the most common cause. Um, reactive adenopathy from inflammation or infection, uh, or even uh, if there's a silicone uh, rupture uh, or leak, you could have adenopathy. The other answer choices listed are, are really differential diagnosis from bilateral axillary lymphadenopathy. 
question five from the um, length of the yellow line shown on this MLO view image, what is the acceptable minimal posterior nipple line measurement on the CC view? And so we have 13 centimeters um, that was, was drawn. And so, again, the posterior nipple line describes an imaginary line drawn from the nipple to the pectoralis muscle or the film edge and perpendicular to the pectoralis muscle. And then adequately exposed breast, um, the, the measurement difference of this line between the MLO and the crane caudal view should not exceed more than one centimeter. So in this case, um, the correct answer would be 12 centimeters. I'm going to go to uh, case three. And case three, um, we have three questions. Which of the following entities is most likely to be represented by the abnormality shown in this image? And so what we have is we have a, a sagittal ultrasound image. These two images are sagittal images of the right axilla. Uh, they give a clock position approximately 11 o'clock, 15 centimeters from the nipple. This is a transverse image. This shows uh, color flow in this, this mass. Um, and this mass, given this, this, is, this appears to be a lymph node with a fatty hilum. Um, and so the, uh, the finding, which majority of you got uh, correct, is that of a lymph node. Um, the other answer choices are completely wrong. Um, the finding is an axillary lymph node. Which of the following findings in present is the most concerning for malignancy? And a majority of you got this incorrect. And, and there are a couple of things that make this lymph node abnormal. Um, one of the, one of the, in which the, is the correct answer choice is you have a thickened cortex. If you look at this, this image right here, we see a thickened cortex. Here's the cortex, this dark area right here. And as we follow along, it's thin right here, then thick again, then thins out, and then gets thick again. We do see a fatty hilum, which is, that's fine. An abnormal lymph node can still have a fatty hilum. Maybe the fatty hilum is partially effaced. Um, but uh, this lymph node is abnormal because of its thickened cortex. Also, the size of the lymph node is greater than 2 centimeters. Um, and that's also a reason why it's abnormal. So of the answer choices, um, thickened cortex would be the correct answer. In this patient with breast cancer, a poor needle biopsy of the lymph node shows metastatic disease. The patient will receive which of the following procedures along with her lumpectomy? And, and you guys... Uh, majority of you guys got this question right in the sense that this patient would require an axillary dissection. And um, if, uh, if an abnormal axillary lymph node is seen on ultrasound in a patient with breast cancer, it should be uh, subjected to a uh, poor, poor biopsy. If the pathology um, shows to be metastatic, the patient undergoes axillary dissection. However, if the node is benign, the patient is scheduled for sentinel node biopsy at the time of surgery. So that, that, this is the important point. A benign percutaneous biopsy of an axillary lymph node does not clear the axilla, and sentinel lymph node biopsy still needs to be performed at time of surgery. So that's really important. Benign biopsy result of, it, uh, of an axillary lymph node uh, does not clear the axilla um, in, in a patient that uh, it has known uh, breast cancer. So um, we're going to go to case. Sir, four. I'm so sorry to interrupt you one more time. Jay Z, yeah. if I could please go, get you to go to your M4. I'm sorry get you to go to your email. Your invoice has now been sent to you. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry to interrupt, sir. 
No, not a problem. Okay, so we're on, on uh, case four. What is the most important finding seen on this galactogram study? And so what we have is two images from a galactogram study. We have, these are spot magnification views of the left breast. So it's a left magnified craniocaudal view, and this is a left magnified medial view. And so what we see is contrast material entering into this duct and, and we see a filling defect. And so we do uh, ductography or lactography in cases where a patient has spontaneous clear or bloody nipple discharge. Um, and so this was a, a galactogram study and it shows a filling defect. So that's the correct answer choice and many of you got that right. Um, as far as what is the most appropriate BIRADS category assessment, that is a bi that, that's a BIRADS 4. Um, patient needs to be referred to a surgeon uh, for excision and um, so we uh, would give this a BIRADS for, for uh, excision. Now, um, as far as a filling defect seen on lactography, um, there, there, there's a differential. Um, the differential diagnosis is that of an introductal papilloma, which is the most common cause for bloody nipple discharge. There's introductal papillary carcinoma, which that's where we get worried, and that's why the patient's going to get surgery. Um, and and then there's other uh, differential diagnosis that of like a air bubble during the procedure. We want to make sure there's no air bubbles in the tubing or in the syringe. Um, that is a differential. Um, and and the other uh, differential is inspissated material within the duct. Um, so those patients, uh, again, that have a filling defect that's seen on the lactography needs, uh, that's considered a, uh, an abnormal, uh, a, a positive lactogram study that, that requires um, a, a excision uh, by a surgeon. Um, so based on the findings on the lactogram, what is the next best step, and that is surgical uh, breast biopsy, as I, as I spoke to you about. Um, what is the most indication to perform lactography? As I as said, it was, it's either spontaneous, clear, bloody, um, serious uh, nipple discharge. And how to administer, how much to administer? Uh, usually it's a very, very small amount, 1 to 3 ml uh, of not anti contrast is uh, injected. Um, so we're going to go to case number five. And case number five, um, what we have is craniocaudal and medial lateral bleed views of both breasts. This is actually the right, this is the right breast, this is the left uh, breast, craniocaudal views, right medial lateral bleed, left medial lateral bleed. And what we, the breast composition is, one could call this heterogeneously dense. And, and what we notice right away is we, we see that the left breast is smaller in size as compared to the right breast. But also what we see is we don't see visualization of the pectoralis muscle. And so um, for the first question, what's the important finding? Well, um, you know, of the, of, the, of the answer choices, it's the abstract, absence of the pelvis major muscle. Um, based on the images, what's the, um, what's the appropriate, most appropriate BIRADS category assessment? A lot of you got this wrong. That, it is a, a BIRADS 1. This, this finding, or the, the absence of the pectoralis major muscle is is uh, the diagnosis is that of Pullman syndrome. Um, and so Pullman syndrome is just a uh, congenital abnormality. And um, it's, it's 
It's that of congenital unilateral hypoplasia or absence of the pectoralis major muscle. Uh, actually more common in males and it's more common on the right side. In this case, we had it on the left side. And it's autosomal recessive in terms of inheritance. And so um, this, this is, uh, we wouldn't need to do any further imaging. It's a, it's a bi reds one, it's negative. There's nothing to suggest for malignancy. Um, Holman syndrome can be associated with the following findings. Um, there's uh, absence of the ipsilateral second through fourth ribs. Um, there's uh, bilateral, um, there, there's actually the associated findings are used. This, this is incorrect as far as um, it's ipsilateral syndactyly and brachydactyly. So it's ipsilateral absence of the pectoralis um, minor muscle, um, hypoplasia of the ipsilateral um, breast. So in this case, the, the breast is smaller. Um, so it's not hypertrophy. Um, and so absence of the ipsilateral second through fourth ribs. What is the inheritance pattern? Um, I, I told you that about, I should have, before it's autosomal recessive. Colon syndrome can be associated with increased incidence of which of the following cancers? Actually, colon syndrome is associated with increased incidence of breast cancer, leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and lung cancer. So of the answer choices, it's lung cancer. Um, one other thing about Poland syndrome is on the chest radiograph, it usually demonstrates unilateral hyperlucency um, on the, the side um, that, that uh, is, is effective. Case uh, 6. Case 6, um, we have uh, a 65-year-old female for a screen mammogram. And what we're shown is uh, craniocaudal views of, of both breasts in 2011. And in 2013, we see craniocaudal views of both breasts. And this is in the same patient. And, and on, this, on this mammogram, breast composition is kind of scattered fibroglandular densities. Um, here it's, it's, it's become more heterogeneously dense or almost to a point of extremely dense. Uh, and so we have a change in breast composition in a 65-year-old. Um, and so they're asking us which of the following findings is, uh, are, are present in the most recent findings, and that is increased breast density. The majority of you got that right which of the following is the most appropriate by rads category assessment in these images, and it's either a one or a two. Um, just based on these images, I don't see anything suspicious um, that warrants any further imaging. What is the most likely cause of increased breast density? The majority of you got this right, estrogen replacement therapy. Um, estrogen replacement therapy um, in a, in a postmenopausal female um, would create uh, a situation where you have increased breast composition. Um, the other uh, findings that of mastitis, inflammatory breast cancer, and trauma can cause increased breast density, but usually uh, for mastitis, inflammatory breast cancer, usually you'll see skin thickening, and in this case we didn't have skin thickening and trauma, usually it's it's uh, more focal rather than diffuse. Um, and so uh, also trauma, you can have increased uh, skin thickening as well. Which of the following conditions causes unilateral um, breast edema? And of the um, answer choices uh, given inflammatory breast cancer, and you guys all got that right, which is good. Um, the other other 
answer choices provided all are um, for bilateral um, bilateral increased breast density edema. And so um, that's excellent. You guys got that right. And uh, which of the following is the average time taken for the breast density to return to baseline after stopping hormone replacement therapy? And, and, the, and this is just, it's usually three, three to months. Um, some texts say four months, but it's, it's about, the majority say three months um, to get this patient back to baseline. Now we're in, in uh, case number seven. In case number seven, um, this table demonstrates data obtained from a breast care center um, of a community hospital in a 12-month period. And, and this is really a question of uh, an audit of, of a breast practice. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's commonly done uh, and, and should be done. Uh, to assess uh, certain parameters of how your radiologists are performing um, and practicing breast imaging. Um, so, and, and to make sure that your, your radiologists are practicing at, at, at the, at the uh, standard of care um, that's deemed acceptable. So, um, so the chart provides uh, the numbers um, of screen mammograms performed, how many um, uh, I read zeros, and so we're going to just go right to the question, what is the screen abnormal interpretation rate or screening recall rate at the center? So um, a screening abnormal interpretation rate is, is that of the by reds 0, 4, and 5 based on screen mammograms. So those are the category assessments that were given at time of the screen mammogram over the total number of screen mammograms. And so what the uh, correct calculation would be that of 600 over 6,000 turns out to be 10 percent. Uh, so the screen abnormal interpretation rate is also also known as a recall rate, and so um, it's uh, the recall rate um, based on the IRAD's uh, fourth edition uh, should be um, less than 10 percent, uh, 10 percent or less. Um, the newer IRAD's uh, uh, fifth edition is 10 to 12 percent. So what is the um, cancer detection rate uh, for, for the screening mammograms at the center? And cancer detection uh, rate is, um, is that of the number of cancers correctly detected at mammography per 1,000 patients examined at mammography. And so um, what we have are the positive biopsies, which were 60, over the total number of screen mammograms. So that turned out to be a calculation of 10 per 1,000. What is the sensitivity? So it's asking, what is the sensitivity? And sensitivity is the probability of detecting a cancer when a cancer exists or the number of cancers diagnosed after being identified at mammography in a population within one year of the imaging examination divided by all the cancers present in that population at the same time period. So it's the true positives over the true positives plus false negatives. And so the true positives were 60, and the false negatives were 10, and so that's the calculation. Um, I have to pull out a calculator for that. Um, so what is the specificity? That's the next question. 
Um, by that time, you're probably thinking, yes, I'd, I'd rather get on to the case here. Um, the probability, that, so specificity is the probability of interpreting an examination as negative when cancer does not exist, or the number of true negative mammograms in a population divided by all the actual negative cases. So it's the true, uh, so it's the true negatives over the false positive one plus true negative. Their false positive one is no known tissue diagnosis of cancer within one year of a positive screen examination. There is false positive two and false positive three. I'm not going to go into that because we don't have enough time, but uh, just know the definitions. That's really important. Um, understanding what is specificity, sensitivity, um, and, and you may have to calculate as well. This is the calculation um, for uh, specificity in this particular case. What is the positive predictive value? And it's spelled here, PPV1. Um, the PPV1 is basically abnormal findings at screen. So it's a percentage of all positive screen examinations that were given up by RAD 0, 4, and 5 that result in a tissue diagnosis of cancer within one year. Um, so it's the true positives over the true positives false over true positives plus false positive one. And so that calculation turned out to be uh, 10%. Case 8. Case 8, we have uh, cranial and medial lateral oblique views of the right breast. Um, this is a zoomed up image of this, and this is a zoomed up image of this body on, on the MMO view. These are not um, diagnostic mammogram views. These are just zoomed up images of these screening mammogram um, findings. So um, what we, we have is the right breast uh, that's scattered from under densities. And what we have here is a cluster of calcifications located in the lower inner quadrant posterior depth. And so the uh, appropriate description would be cluster of calcifications. Majority of you got it wrong. M many of you may have given this answer, cluster of pleomorphic. We don't give morphology at, uh, of a finding that we think is maybe a new finding that, that needs to be worked up or is something that's suspicious. So we only give morphology um, on a screening mammogram if it's, if it's something definitely benign. But if it's something that we're going to work up and give it a by rate zero, um, we're just going to give its location and its distribution, and that's it. We're going to refrain from giving morphology. And so all we're going to do is give this a by rate zero, call it a cluster of calcifications, lower inner quadrant, posterior depth. Because if I would have given pleomorphic calcifications, and then we do the diagnostic workup, and then on, on the true mag uh, view um, of, of these calcifications lay layer and teacup, then I look like a fool. Then I, I'm, these are milk of calcium. They're a by rads to benign calcifications. But yet on the screening mammogram, I called it a pleomorphic calcifications, which are higher probability for malignancy. That doesn't look kosher. That doesn't sit well. And so we, that's why we refrain from giving morphology on a screening mammogram of a finding that we see um, that we want to work up further. Uh, for definite benign calcifications, you can call it right there, like secretory calcifications. Um, but in this case, we just call it a cluster of calcifications. Um, which of the following diagnostic mammogram views is preferred as part of the diagnostic workup to further assess these calcifications? Um, so these calcifications are located lower inner quadrant, posterior depth. Um, so of the answer choices, we would not want to mag it in the MLO. Because why? Because we always, always want to exclude one diagnosis, and that is milk of calcium. 
The milk and calcium is best appreciated on a lateral mag view, um, whether it's LM or medial lateral. Um, now, we were given the answer choice of a medial lateral or lateral medial. Well, lateral medial would be the better choice because the finding is more medially located. And so um, we would, the reason why we want to do that is our cassette or receptor is going to be on the medial aspect. We want it closest to the lesion, um, in this case calcifications. And so uh, we, we do a lateral medial view. If, if, this, if this finding was laterally located, then we would have done a spot mag ML. Question three, based on the diagnostic mammogram images, which of the one of the following uh, uh, which of the following mammogram lexicon terms best describes the finding? So now we've gotten our spot mag views, um, and now we can get morphology, and it's a cluster uh, clusters that have uh, uh, calcifications within a cubic centimeter. Um, what we have is at a Find pleomorphic calcifications. Um, the other answer choices is not segmentally distributed. Um, group calcifications are calcifications that are uh, less than five calcifications in a cubic centimeter, um, and so uh, that's that's not the case. Um, and we don't have punctate calcifications in cluster. These are kind of different shapes and sizes. So. Uh, B would be the correct answer choice. Um, based on the diagnostic images, which one of the following is most appropriate? And majority have got this right, BIRADS uh, category four. We want to biopsy it, and we can biopsy it by stereotactic guidance. If it's amenable for a stereotactic biopsy, uh, that would be the, the uh, correct answer choice. Uh, and, and, and stereotactic biopsy uh, limitations is that uh, if it's located too far posterior to the chest wall or too anterior close to the nipple, that, that, those are some limitations um, of stereotactic biopsy. Also the breast thickness. Um, the general rule is, is two centimeters in breast thickness. If it's less than two centimeters, it can be a difficult biopsy to do. Or the patient may not be amenable for a stereotactic biopsy. In that case, the patient needs a wider localization procedure. Question uh, five, uh, core biopsy specimens showed only two calcifications and uh, pathology res results showed benign fibrocystic changes with microcalcifications. Um, in this particular case, we, um, the correct answer choice would be A. Um, as far as the, the um, if it only showed two calcifications and fibrocystic changes, um, this would be considered discordant. Um, with these type of calcifications, uh, one would, would expect, uh, wouldn't expect fibrocystic changes, um, and so one would want to re-biopsy it. Um, but the best option would be that of a surgical consultation for excisional biopsy. To try to say repeat serotactic biopsy, one could, but you might get the same result. Um, it may have been a difficult biopsy, so it's just best to go to a surgical consultation for situational biopsy. As far as case number nine, um, we have craniocaudal and medial-lateral views um, of both breasts, and um, and this is a palpable abnormality. Uh, that scene. Um, and, and what we have is the, this round skin marker is that of a mole and the triangle is a palpable abnormality and the, the uh, markers or these radiopaque BBs are, are the equally markers placed on the nipple. So nipple markers and what we have is an area of asymmetry um, we could call it a focal asymmetry um, in the retroarial region. Um, this patient 
it actually happens to be a male, um, which uh, one could tell as far as the pectoralis muscle. Um, this is this is a bi res two. Of the other answer choices, um, this is basically gynecomastia, unilateral gynecomastia, um, and uh, gynecomastia is benign, um, and gynecomastia is is uh, the male enlargement of the breast. And it can be due to uh, the most common cause is that idiopathic, but uh, there, there are multiple causes of gynecomastia that drugs um, and other things that have uh, uh, testicular cancers. Uh, the drugs that can cause gynecomastia uh, are thiazides, uh, reserping cardiac glycosides, and um, there's a question on this. And so based on the images and clinical history, which of the following is the best next step in management? Uh, obtain a careful drug history. You wouldn't want to do a target ultrasound. Nasty on an ultrasound it looks it's kind of ugly looking. Uh, and um, one would want to uh, feel more prone to want to biopsy it. So we don't we can detect that hypomastia just on, on the mammogram. Um, if there was an actual mass that we saw um, on, on the mammogram, then we would proceed to an ultrasound. Um, we wouldn't need to biopsy it uh, for a cytological analysis. We don't need to refer the patient to a breast surgeon or even perform a breast MRI. What is the most common cause? I said it's the most common cause. Um, you know, are causes of gynecomastia, but the most common is idiopathic. We ca uh, cause gynecomastia. Um, Kleinfelter syndrome is a cause um, of uh, gynecomastia. Um, secondary hypogonadism, uh, gynecomastia, tamoxifen, danazole, and clopidine are, are pharmacologic agents used to treat gynecomastia. Um, those were uh, incorrect answer choices. Case 10. Case 10 uh, shows the uh, breast MR image. Uh, this is a uh, uh, subtracted uh, image. And um, what, which of the following artifacts is seen in this image? And one of the things that we, um, we do in, in breast imaging is, is we saturate out the fat. Um, now, fat is, is typically not our friend, and so um, fat saturation is really important for breast cancer detection um, on MRI. And so, high signal of fat interaction Dr. Shaw, sorry to interrupt you again. Did you turn and away so, for a second? Uh, because they're having a different unexpected variation in the Dr. Shaw. Uh, the enrollees are having a difficult time hearing you again. Oh, okay. Did you turn away? Uh, no, no, I. No, I mean, I may be turning my head, so maybe. That's okay, so if you'd speak just a little bit louder, I'm so sorry. Okay, no, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so I'll just reiterate: fat saturation is important for breast cancer detection on MRI. High signal effect interferes with the detection of enhancing uh, lesions. And so for when there's an unexpected variation in the magnetic field, there'll be protons and fat that are precessing out of the range of the frequency included in the um, suppression pulse. So these protons will not be suppressed. And so what we have is a case example. This is nice in terms of fat saturation, but then it gets bright out here. And, and that is inhomogeneous fat saturation artifact. Um, and so the other answer choices, I can't go into all of these 
Um, although I'm going to show you some questions or cases that have these artifacts. Um, just know the various different types. And these are some good types of artifacts that you, you might want to know and, and to be able to recognize um, that, that is seen on uh, breast MRI. As far as um, which of the following steps can help reduce this breast MRI artifact. And that's also an important thing to, to know what are the steps that can help all the different types of breast MRI, uh, MRI artifacts. In this particular uh, case, um, since we have, this is a case of um, fat, uh, inhomogeneous fat saturation, shimming the magnet, optimizing the field homogeneous, homogeneity of the uh, MR unit to correct some of the inhomogeneous fat saturation artifacts. This is uh, another image and it's asking which of the following artifacts is seen in this image. And so what what we're seeing is, is this artifact that's going along this plane here. Um, and and what this is is, is a ghosting artifact or due pa to patient motion. And artifact from patient motion propagates in the phase encoding direction regardless of the direction uh, the direction of the patient motion. So um, in this case we have the phase encoding is, is direction is this and that's why we're giving this artifact. So motion can result in of moving tissues but also can um, cause a structured noise pattern resulting in ghosting of brighter moving tissues in the phase encoding direction. As far as uh, which of the following steps can help reduce this breast MRI artifact, um, Jordy, you got this right, uh, and, that, and that is uh, you know, reducing patient motion, um, making the patient comfortable as possible, and asking the patient to hold still. Um, during the MRI examination will help um, prevent the patient motion artifact on, on breast MRI. Okay, which of the following artifacts is seen on this image? Um, and many of you got this right. This is a, a susceptibility artifact. Uh, there's a, a local um, signal uh, void, intensity void, with partial surrounding area of high signal uh, intensity and image distortion in the sternum. This represents metallic susceptibility artifact from sternotomy wires. We're going to go to case 11. So case 11 shows a, a set of images um, and it's this is a post-contrast subtracted image. Um, and what we have here is a left breast and a right breast. And this is a delayed post-contrast fat saturation in the left breast. And this is a color overlay post-contrast using the CAD software. Um, and so uh, this cursor was placed over this area, this lesion which generated a time intensity curve. Um, so what we have here is a irregular enhancing mass located in the lower inner quadrant of the left breast anteriorly. And it's uh, somewhat homogeneously enhancing. And so of the answer choices, um, this would be a homogeneously enhancing mass. Um, on, on the, uh, in the BIRADS atlas, they pick two show examples of, of non-mass-like enhancement, pumped enhancement, um, be worth looking into in terms of on your own time. 
to look at, at examples um, shown on, on, on Preston Y and those, those other types of lesions. So um, based on, on the images, what would be the appropriate BI-RADS category assessment um, for this case? Uh, that would be a BI-RADS 4. Uh, one would want a biopsy. The time intensity curve, um, while it's helpful, we don't rest our hat on it. This is a, a, a rapid wash in, wash out. Um, so it's a type 3 curve. And so um, what we rely on on breast MRI, more importantly, is the morphology of the lesion on MRI. Time intensity curve is just an added benefit. But we don't, we don't rest our hats on, on, on what the time intensity curve shows. But this would mark a biopsy. Um, and uh, as far as additional images were shown, uh, shows a homogeneously enhancing lobular mass in the upper outer quadrant. Kinetic assessment of the mass using CAD processing software demonstrates which type of curve. And um, this, this is actually uh, um, in the mass. It actually has a signal void, which is from a biopsy proven. Uh, this was biopsy proven to be a cancer, and there's a clip that was placed. This is this is a type three curve. Uh, just doesn't have enough plateau to it, and it's a, a type one would be persistent. Um, so if some of you thought it's type two. This might be a bit tricky. I mean, it's it's usually flat. This is still um, a type three. Curve. The second set of uh, MR images on the same day shows a uh, biopsy proven malignancy in the upper outer quadrant posteriorly. The other mass seen on MRI was in the lower inner quadrant. So we had this was in the lower inner quadrant, and that was that turned out to be invasive ductal carcinoma. And the other one was, was cancer. So they're asking what statement is correct. Um, and the findings are consistent for multicentric disease. And so multicentric disease uh, versus multifocal is, is just important to know the difference between the two. Uh, multifocal disease is lesions in the same quadrant of the breast while multicentric disease is lesions in separate quadrants of the breast. So uh, this is a, a perfect example of that. Which of the following statements regarding this case is correct? The patient is a, a candidate for mastectomy. The majority of you got this right. This is multicentric disease. And so in a, in a, a multicentric uh, disease, these are patients most likely treated with mastectomy. Um, multicentric or diffuse disease is a contraindication to whole breast radiation therapy. So um, we're going to go to case 12. And case 12 um, is a case that uh, I, I kind of took uh, that's very similar to the ABR practice exam. Uh, this shows a, a this is a 41 year old female with palpable lump at, at two o'clock left breast. So we have left breast MLO and CC. Breasts are, are heterogeneously dense, and we, what we see is a round oval mass in the upper outer quadrant at a middle to posterior depth. And so um, this is a mass because we see that two views and it has convex motors and so the, the appropriate um, answer would be that of the mass. Based on uh, the images, what's the most uh, appropriate virus category? One would give this a zero uh, if it was just uh, and, and would want further workup um, and would want to do either additional views or an ultrasound. Um, and question 
three to five based on the ultrasound images, what's the, uh, what is the finding? And that is a simple system. Majority of you got that answer right. It's an anechoic mass. Um, so it's the simple system is anechoic, has um, through transmission, posterior enhancement, imperceptible walls with no internal vascularity. Based on the images, what's the appropriate bi res category assessment? All of you guys got this right. bi res too. It's a benign finding. Nothing further needs to be done. Uh, sometimes we'll aspirate the cyst for symptomatic relief for a patient that may have discomfort, uh, but these can be left alone. Based on the images, which of the following is the most appropriate management? No further evaluation. Um, we don't need to do antibiotic therapy. This is not an abscess. This is not a solid mass that needs a corneal biopsy. And we don't need to cyst aspirate it for a diagnosis. This is a simple cyst. And I go to case 13. Case 13, um, which of the following is, uh, is the finding shown on these images? Um, so we have an MLO view, a cranial caudal view, and a medial lateral view. This is a palpable abnormality in a 32-year-old. And what we see, uh, is the breast composition is extremely dense. On the MLO views, we have this almost this fat density or low density mass in the upper and outer quadrant, almost middle to posterior depth. But what ices this case for a diagnosis even is, is this ML view where we see a fat fluid level to this mass. Um, so this is a mixed density mass. And that's the correct answer. There are it's a differential diagnosis for mixed density masses. Um, but whenever you see something flat like this, like a fluid level, this and a fat fluid level, an extremely dense breast, this is a galactosecal. Um, and so uh, I'm going to go to the next question. What is the most appropriate location of the mass? This is testing your clock positions. Um, so you know, sometimes, uh, you know, if, you, if you're if you confused about the uh, clock, you know, you can always use yourself and feel yourself in terms of where it's located. Um, you know, I wouldn't do that too often in public, but, you know, on an exam, if you have to uh, give a clock position, you can try to, you know, do that, and that's a useful tool, and um, you know, try to visualize it. Um, so this, this is located at 1 o'clock. Um, you know, it's, it's as if you were looking at the breast. Um, we actually have a uh, picture right here. And so um, this is this is uh, lesion location, and so this is a right breast. This is as if you were looking at the patient, and so the uh, lesion was uh, more in the upper outer quadrant um, because it's upper and outer and so um, it's it would be approximately one o'clock um, so we give clock positions um, often and, uh, and especially when we do an ultrasound we, we usually like to tell the technologist to do a target ultrasound between these clock positions and go to question three through five Based on the images, what's the appropriate bi res category assessment? And um, this this shows the fat fluid level. So the fluid is the anechoic part, and this kind of hypoechoic area on top is the milk um, of, of the galactosecal. Um, and so this is a classic appearance of a galactosecal. There's no internal vascularity. Um, these are benign. They usually self-resolve. Um, sometimes we aspirate them um, in, in situations where a uh, patient is complaining of uh, extreme discomfort, and it's more for symptomatic relief. Um, based on the ultrasound images, what's the most likely diagnosis? So that's a uh, galactosecal. Um, 
differential diagnosis for a mixed density uh, lesion is that of the hematoma and uh, intravampillary uh, lymph node uh, are, are examples um, of uh, mixed density um, masses. What is the recommendation? You wouldn't need to do anything further. This is benign, and so this patient would just start their mammogram at the age of 40. Uh, this lady was uh, in her 30s, so um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have her go back to a mammogram it's just until the age of 40. Case 14 um, is, shows a craniocaudal and uh, views of both breasts, and it shows these little arrows right here. Um, and this is just an example of a normal bearing that we sometimes see. And um, that is of uh, the sternalis muscle. And the sternalis muscle is seen only best appreciated on the craniocaudal view. Um, so, so it's very typical to see these areas of asymmetries located medially and posterior depth kind of flame shape, um, and that is of the sternalis muscle. Uh, sternalis muscle is an anatomic variant of the chest wall musculature, and it's, it's located medial and parasternal, and um, it's just, a, again, a normal anatomic variant. And so um, the uh, appropriate BIRADS category assessment one would give is that a BIRADS 1. Which of the following is uh, is correct regarding um, uh, the sternalis muscle? Um, it is found in less than 10% of individuals, and um, uh, it's uh, often unilateral as compared to bilateral, and um, really just can't be seen on the uh, lateral or MLO views. Go to is 15. This I already stressed the importance. And this is a phantom image. And um, a phantom image is, is something that we do as a QC um, to evaluate um, background density, contrast, uniformity, um, and number of objects seen. So, um, a mammography phantom image obtained during a weekly check should show which of the following to meet minimum, minimum acceptable criteria. And the correct answer, which the majority of you got, was uh, four fibers, three calcification clusters, and three masses. So um, the masses are, are these masses. Um, the calcifications are these white specks and the fibers are, are these. Um, so again, a phantom um, is to evaluate background density, contrast, uniformity, and number of objects seen. And it simulates a 4 to 4.5 centimeter compressed breast, which actually contains in this phantom six different fibers, five groups of microcalcifications, and five masses. However, the ACR, ACR criteria requires a, a minimal score of visibility of at least four fibers, three microcalcifications, and three masses. So we're going to go to case 16. And case 16 um, is an MLO view taken during the screening mammogram to demonstrate which type of digital mammogram artifact. Um, I would know all these different types of artifacts. This is an example of motion artifact. It's blurring. Um, if you if you see, there's blurring of the tissues, and um, and so um, just know the various types of artifacts seen on mammography um, and breast MRI. Case uh, sixteen. Which of the following uh, types of breast implant is shown in this um, image? 
and uh, you're given just an answer choice between single lumen and double lumen. This is this is a sagittal stir water sat image showing a prepectoral double lumen implant, and what's saturated out is the water or, or the saline, so the dark portions of saline and the bright areas are silicone. And so we have some saline floating in silicone. This is kind of the solid oil sign of a implant rupture, of an intracapsular rupture. Uh, so which of the following is the diagnosis and that is of an intracapsular rupture? of the uh, implant. Um, and so um, intracapsular rupture is, is rupture of the implant shell or envelope. Um, it results in, in, in uh, the double lumen implant results in mixing the contents of the inner and outer lumina, giving rise to what I said, the salad oil sign due to the mixing of the uh, miscible uh, silicone and saline. Next case is for questions three and four. Which of the following types of breast implant is shown in this case? Uh, this is an example of a silicone, um, a single lumen uh, silicone implant, and and um, just a single lumen consists of only one substance. You know, that's usually saline or silicone. Um, while a double lumen contains two envelopes inside, one another, one uh, another that um, is basically two envelopes inside one another, which one can contain either you know, uh, contain saline or silicone. And so what we're seeing are these serpiginous uh, areas of signal within this implant. This is the Linguini sign, um, and that is an example of intracapsular rupture. Um, and so many of you guys got this right as an example of intercapsular rupture of a single movement. Uh, this is uh, question five. Uh, based on the images, what is the diagnosis? This is um, the stir water sat image. So we have a single lumen silicone breast implant. And what we're seeing is, is uh, kind of serpiginous signal inside and as well as kind of leakage of fluid outside the implant. So this is a case of intracapsular and extracapsular rupture um, so, uh, of, of the implant. Case 18, uh, which is our last case, um, which of the following artifacts is present on this T1 non fat saturated localizer image? Um, so what we what we're seeing um, is here's a sagittal image, um, and we're seeing the breast, and we're seeing some used to be like a, a image right here, and it's this is a case of phase wrap or allicine. Um Phase wrap uh, or wrap around artifact occurs when not all of the signal producing tissue is within the field of view. And so it, it occurs in the phase encoding direction. Uh, the artifact is really due to signal from excited tissue outside the field of view that becomes superimposed on structures within the field of view through misregistration uh, during the uh, Fourier uh, transform reconstruction. Um, so the next question is which of the following measures can reduce phase wrap or illicit artifact on breast MI? And, and the way to, to correct this would be to increase the field of view, increasing the number of sampling points in the phase encoding direction or enlarging the field of view can correct this artifact. So uh, that is the conclusion. Um, Before you begin answering your questions, Dr. Shaw, let me remind our enrollees that at 2 o'clock today we have neuro, 
and that would be at 2 o'clock Eastern. Okay, Dr. Shad, have you had a chance to undock your question panel? Let me, uh, let me do that right now. And I undocked it, yep. Okay, and then you're going to have to enlarge it with your cursor on all sides. And that way you can see the arrows. Okay. And if you click on received, and you can double click whatever you need, you will be able to see the order they came in. They're a little bit easier to answer that way. And I believe the first one is case one, question two. Case one. Should I and, the yours are, and yours are flat. Yes. Um, okay. Can you, okay, can you go back to, I lost, um, can you go back, it was, can you go back to case number 17, part four? Um, 